Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Dorsey's l &E Briefing, How to Avoid Landmines in Onboarding and Terminating California Employees. I'd like to introduce Gabrielle Worth, a partner in Dorsey's Labor and Employment Group. Gabrielle? Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. A couple of um, preliminary housekeeping matters. Number one, uh, many of you are clients, but this is not an attorney-client privilege discussion, so please ask your questions as hypotheticals and we'll be happy to answer. Um, feel free to give us a call after the seminar if something hit a particular chord and you'd like to talk about it in depth. Um, we will be taking chat questions during the materials and answering them after each section. If we don't get to your question, please feel free to email us directly afterwards and we will try and um, take care of your questions. The materials are available from the Dorsey login and events at dorsey.com. There's a CLE code that'll be provided approximately halfway through the seminar material. We expect CLE in Arizona, California, Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, North Dakota, New Jersey, Oregon, Texas, Utah, Washington, and Wisconsin. And please don't forget to return your attendance form to attendance at dorsey.com so that we can follow up with any certifications that you need for your particular state. So this morning is a little bit different from some of our seminars. You won't hear as many legal citations today. We were asked by multiple clients to have a practical discussion as to what we are seeing as the issues that are getting employers in trouble in California with respect to hiring and firing mistakes. And we are going to take note because people often assume that California is off on its own and that there's no other state where this is a problem. And we'll try and comment when it is a problem in other states as well, so you can keep that in mind. So, First five mistakes we want to talk about, actually six mistakes, are uh, trying to make employees independent contractors or make non-exempt employees exempt, uh, failure to post policies and notices, which seems like a simple thing but is getting many people in trouble, what to do to prepare for the California Consumer Privacy Act, what's going on on the front of sexual harassment and many companies are forgetting to do their training, arbitration agreements, and then pay equity. And we monitor the filings in every state. So this is not just our personal experience, but experience from monitoring the filings in California and beyond. So the first issue is misclassification. The initial misclassification we are seeing a ton of is trying to have people be independent contractors versus employees. Many people, when they're foraging into a new state, look at California and say, I can solve all these problems if I just make them independent contractors, and then I don't have to worry about California's wacky laws. Well, that doesn't work. Um, California has been addressing this both uh, in the courts and in the legislatures, and we have a whole slew of new laws about when you can and can't be an independent contractor. And of course, as being California, there's no one rule that applies to all instances. So you can have an employee be an independent contractor under a wage and hour statute, but be found to be an employee for workers' comp purposes, for example. And so we wanna talk about that a little bit. On the next slide, you'll see the most common tests that are, are throughout the different statutes that apply here. The presumption in California is that a person providing labor or services for, for money shall be considered an employee, um, previous slide, Melanie, Sorry. shall be considered an employee and not an independent contractor unless three prongs of what's been known as the ABC test are met. The person is free from the control and direction of the hiring entity in connection with the performance of work under both the contract and in fact. The person performs work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business. And the person is customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, or business. We are seeing a ton of excellently written contracts that look like the person is an independent contractor. And where it's falling apart is we get the lawsuit and it says that in fact, the person has never worked for anybody but Dorsey and Whitney for the last 20 years. There was a reduction in force and they eliminated the California office and they just converted those they wanted to stay to be an independent contractor. Well, you can see that that is going to be a hard one to win because the person is still under the same control of the same entity they were while they were employee. The work is not outside the normal course of the entity's business because in fact an employee used to do it and nobody else is paying for any part of their uh, economic reality. So they're not in an independently established trade or occupation because they're really working for nobody but Dorsey. Those are the most common tests we're seeing. 
And even if you think that you fall under one of the new exceptions that came out in the statute, for example, example the business to business exemption, it is true that independent contractors should get their own license and start their own business. But even under the business to business exemption, the category that you see under B of the ABC test is stated a little differently, but it's stated as the provider is doing service for the business and is not doing service for the customer's business. So to the extent you've hired someone to be providing services to your customer, it's not outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business. So as conflicting as these different rules are, the, the issue is that if you are in California and in other states, you should be having careful look taken at the actual reality of how your independent contractor contracts are operating. If in fact the contract reads great, but the person has no other business, if they're providing services to your customers, those are the sorts of things that should bring a red flag up and you might consider having another solution to these uh, independent contractors. The second issue we're seeing is that people forget that in California, exempt, non-exempt, the salary changes every year um, to adjust to be twice the minimum wage. And so for employees in, in 2022, with fewer than 25 employees, the exempt salary is 58,240. And for those with more than 25 employees, the exempt salary is 62,400. So it's very important. You lose the status if you're not paying the correct uh, salary exemption. You can fix that if you do it early on in the year. There is an exception that allows you to make, to make adjustments for mistakes, but that is something you need to pay attention to every January 20, every January 1st. The next issue we want to talk about is the commissions. Um, commissions are paid based on the value of services and goods sold. And so you cannot be paying commissions based on some other number and just calling it commission. It's either related to the cost of the goods or the cost of the service provided. And the example of California, more than half the total pay has to equal commission. And then there's a basic test that the earnings have to be more than one and a half times minimum wage. We've seen a number of lawsuits arising out of the fact that someone wants to pay more in the lines of bonuses that are not directly related to the value of the products sold or the value of the services provided. And that tends to be one that is getting people um, in trouble increasingly. Physicians and surgeons can still be exempt independent contractors, but their primary duty has to be a task requiring a license. And so this was a lot of the litigation that occurred with um, telehealth cases and with people who were pharmacists. In that if the, if, if the actual task they're doing on a, on a minute by minute basis doesn't add up to more than half of the day requiring a, a license to do it, then they cannot be exempt. And there are statutes in California for the minimum pay for both doctors and for computer professionals. For doctors, it's $84.79. For computer professionals, it's $46.55. And the important thing on com computer professionals that we're seeing is a trend to want to put your person who's just in charge of issuing computers and installing Word and other things on your computer as an exempt computer professional. The duties that they have have to require exercise of discretion and judgment. And most of the people who are just in charge of providing computers to employees cannot meet that test. So that is the other big area in California where we're seeing errors in this classification. So hi everyone, my name is Melanie Jordan. I'm an associate here in the Southern California office, also working with Gabrielle in employment issues. And so here I'm going to discuss other issues that employers encounter on the front end, which would include overlooking certain policies and documents that would be mandatory um, and otherwise required across a broad a number of industries. So here in California, um, employers are required to provide both notices, handouts, and, and pamphlets to employees directly, and they're required to post the posters in the workplace, which is not different or not too different than the requirements that you see on the federal level. But here, it's really helpful to combat any issues that may pop up later on, which we'll discuss further. The key here is documenting that the employees received these notices and reviewed the poster. Um, this is important because if the employers fail to, for example, hand out the notice or post the posters, um, it could be a labor code violation and there could be penalties, fines, or sanctions that are assessed. Um, and of course, those things vary by agency and they're you know, fact dependent. But for example, failing to post the Cal OSHA 
safety and health protection poster could result in a thousand dollar fine. Further and probably more important to all of you is by providing these documents, you can prove that the employee was on notice of the rights that are addressed within the brochure pamphlet or within the poster. So in order to document that this employee received the, the poster or the document and they were on notice of their rights, this can be easily accomplished by inserting you know, a written acknowledgement form. Just they acknowledge that they received the form. And this of course can be accomplished um, by e-signature. You just need to make sure that you can verify your e-signature process. And so you'll see on the slide here, I mentioned the California Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, just to make sure you abide by that should issues come up in the future. And so here I first wanna focus on the notices and handouts. These are the actual materials that will be handed directly to the employee or otherwise provided to them. You'll note in your materials that we've included a list of generally applicable notices and brochures that will be handed directly to the employee. But I did wanna point out that that list is not inclusive, all inclusive, it doesn't cover every industry, but it's a great starting point for, for the majority of you. And even here on this slide, I just highlight a portion of those documents that are on the list. So again, please be mindful of that. Um, a document that I felt would be important to highlight for today's purposes would be first the wage and employment notice that is provided to employees. Um, this document's required by the Wage Theft Protection Act of 2011, requires them to provide them, meaning employers, to provide each employee with written notice containing specific, specified um, information such as you know, overtime, the rate of pay, the date of the regular payday, and so forth. Another document that's helpful here is the paid family leave document. California's paid family leave law actually requires that this notice be provided to new employees and to employees who request leave to um, care for a severely or seriously injured uh, or ill family member and to those who seek to bond with a new child. So employers will often provide this at the beginning of the employment relationship, but forget to do that when the employee requests to exercise their paid family leave rights. Of course, you also have your disability insurance provisions. That's important because it actually defines what a disability is and explains California's disability insurance plans. Then you have your family care, medical leave, pregnancy disability handouts, along with your CIFRA, Camel California Family Rights Act um, handouts as well. That defines the employee's entitlement to take leave under the California Family Rights Act. And then the last notice that I wanted to highlight was the sexual harassment fact sheet. This is especially important in today's you know, Me Too movement. Um, it's required that all California employers provide this notice to the employees. And it also goes hand in hand with sexual harassment training that's required as well. Um, which we'll discuss later on in this briefing. Uh, Melanie, we had a question. Do yes, all or any of these documents listed on the slide need to be acknowledged in writing with the receipt? Um, yes, I would, I would strongly encourage that. So you can um, provide all the documents and then you can create a separate acknowledgement of receipt form for the employee to sign and or do that via e-verify process if you have onboarding that occurs um, electronically. And I well, think the what, posters, we're seeing, what we're seeing oh, on ahead, this is that um, employers who do this and circulate the documents on a regular basis can then in defense to, for example, a failure to provide family leaves um, lawsuit, say, look, we gave notice when the employee was employed, here's the proof, we gave notice once a year, we automatically, whatever it, anybody asks for any kind of leave, we include everything. We give paid family leave, here's your disability pamphlet, here's your unemployment pamphlet, here's your workers' comp pamphlet. And they are much better able to prove that the employee knew of their rights and that they did not uh, take any steps to try and discourage people from taking a leave. So while there's no law that says you have to do it and get a signature, as Melanie noted, we recommend you do. That's right. And we recommend that also for the posters that you post in the workplace. So California requires numerous posters. And of course, they vary by industry as well. So keep that in mind. Um, there is a list of posters as well. But again, as we said, with the notices and handouts portion of the materials, that list is not all inclusive, but it's a great starting point. Um, for the posters, you need to make sure that they're posted in a conspicuous place in the workplace for all employees to be able to see it. And one poster in particular that I really wanted to point out was a wage order. Um, 
It provides specific rules about minimum wage, overtime, proper classification of certain positions, as Gabrielle discussed earlier. Um, and this document is not, it's often not included in, say, like a package that you may purchase online that would include, you know, your California and federal posters that need to go in the workplace. And this makes sense, right? Because the wage order is specific to the employer. The employer has to decide which industry they fall in, and they need to decide if they fall within an industry wage order or an occupational wage order. So it's worth thinking through to head off issues later on. And so besides the wage order, I wanted to point out that the, you need to post your paid sick leave information. Um, this complies with the Healthy Workplace, Healthy Family Act of 2014, which we've all become very familiar with following COVID. But I did want to point out here that there are certain locales that require um, or have their own poster, I should say. So for example, in San Francisco, they have their own paid sick leave poster, but that poster complies not only with San Francisco city ordinance, but with the states as well. So you have to be cognizant of where you're located in California because there may be an additional or different rule here. Um, of course, you have your payday notice, which tells the employees, this is the day that you are paid. And it also indirectly communicates to them that the employer is abiding by California's payday rules. Um, also, you'll have your workplace safety postings. Those are important. Workers' compensation postings, those are important. And lastly, I wanted to point out that you'll have whistleblower protections that sh should be posted in the workplace as well. Um, this is required for all employers. And again, failing to post this could lead to a fine or um, sanctions. This notice will describe what a whistleblower is, um, how they're protected, and it tells employees how they can report violations. We'll circle back to whistleblower issues when we talk about termination because we'll need to broaden our understanding of whistleblowers to make sure that we don't run into any issues. Melanie, before you start the CCPA, we had a question about what you do if all your workers are remote and you have no office. Mm -hmm. You really have two or two or three ways of dealing with it. Many uh, employers are having California portal pull up. So the employee gets, when they sign in, they get, you know, do you want to go to the California portal? So that the notices are available there. Um, others are sending it out or doing both. Um, so. It really depends on how many workers you have that are remote in California, but probably putting a physical copy in their hands. Um, most of the notices we have reprint into your handbook. So for example, the information on paid family leave, disability leave, we usually insert into your handbook. So it's there as well. And then um, having getting a physical copy mailed to them at some point is a good idea. Right, very good point. And so I and wanna right share- now, the labor commissioner is allowing internet posting as long as all employees uh, are given a company computer. So if you're not giving them a computer, then mm -hmm. they're not taking internet postings. But if you're employing, if you're uh, giving your employees a, a company computer, then that is sufficient. Right. And so along the lines of talking about mandatory policies and documents on the front end, we did want to flag just quickly for you here, considerations under California's Consumer Privacy Act or the CCPA. Now, this isn't a new law, it was passed back in 2018, so four years ago, but I think it's something that's overlooked and could bring potential issues, especially in light of the California um, Privacy Rights Act, which seeks to amend the CCPA, so the CPRA, and a lot of those provisions will take place at the top of the year, January 1st, 2023. So we'll briefly flag this for your consideration. Um, this is an area that, I and a few other attorneys here at Dorsey work on when it comes to the employment relationship. So the CCPA, um, when you're thinking about it, a lot of people tend to skip over considering whether it even applies to their business. They just assume privacy, data, those are important, I should consider it, which is, that's a wonderful thought, but make sure that the CCPA even applies to your business. So it applies to companies that do business, in California um, and that have either one of three things. They either have an annual gross revenue of over $25 million, they're buying, selling, or receiving data from over 50,000 California households, um, or they're deriving at least 50% of their annual revenue from selling California residents' personal information. So if you look at that as a mental checklist, then you can move on and determine 
if you need to do anything with respect to employee and personnel data, which we refer to as HR data for ease of reference here. Um, it's important to note right now that HR data is largely exempt from the CCPA. Um, this covers personal information, and I'll read here um, from a job applicant, employee, medical staff member, a contractor even, as long as this information is collected in the context of um, an employment relationship or business relationship, and you maintain it for emergency contact information or you're administering benefits. So typically what you would collect an employment relationship, that means that data is largely exempt. So although it's generally exempt for now, there are some existing obligations that um, employers need to be aware of. And that includes safeguarding this data in the first place, right? I think I saw a report from another state where there was actually a data breach concerning employees' pay information. So this isn't something that's you know ethereal or um, theoretical in nature. It's practically, it does happen. So safeguarding your employee data here, especially in California, is going to be key, unless you um, run into issues with someone asserting uh, civil action, which they can under the CCPA. But more importantly for today's purposes, you also wanna provide a notice to the employees regarding how the data is collected and how it's used in the workplace. So what goes in this notice, right? A lot of people are always surprised to hear like, what, I need to provide a notice? You absolutely do. Um, the notice, there's there's no model that's provided under the CCPA. Really what the CCPA requires is that the employer describe the categories of personal information that's being collected and the purposes for which it's being used. Um, if you sit down you know, with HR and um, your IT team, this can actually be easily accomplished when all um, you know, implicated individuals are at the table and discussing this and working together. Um, I wanted to flag a couple of, you know, categories here just to get your, you know, wheels turning, and that would be sensitive personal information. Um, this information is just essentially just regular personal information as defined by the CCPA, but it reveals um, sensitive information such as your social security number. Um, account login, your employee's precise geolocation. So if you have employees who drive company vehicles and you have a way to determine where they are, either through GPS, you can do that precisely. CCPA may be implicated there. Um, biometric information is another common area that this can pop up, whether you have people clocking in using their fingerprints or their handprint in general. And for those of you who are multinational employers, um, this, list or this description of sensitive personal information may sound familiar. And that's because the definition of sensitive personal information was lifted from the European Union's GDPR. Um, the GDPR has sensitive personal data and the CCPA just pretty much swiped it and called it sensitive personal information. I do wanna note that um, when it comes to this kind of information, you can lump it in with other categories of information within the notice unless you're using this information to draw inferences about the workplace. I don't really see that being an issue in the employment context, but if you are drawing inferences about the workplace, then you'll need to separately define that within the notice. And then lastly, I wanted to flag that your notice needs a retention schedule, um, meaning you either need to set out how often or how long you're retaining certain categories, or you can at least explain the criteria used to determine your retention period. This can be accomplished by referencing back to state and local law, as well as your own company's retention schedule. So this requires the employers to really think through how long um, the, the categories of personal information are being retained. For example, here in California, personnel files um, typically needed to be retained for three years. Now it's changed to four years. So in thinking about that, that would also link back to disclosing that information into the CCPA notice. We also wanted to note when you need to provide the notice, this needs to be given to the employees at or before the point of collection of the personal information. As of now, this notice also needs to um, be accompanied by a copy of the privacy policy, the broader uh, privacy policy that the company may have, um, or link to it as well. This portion or this requirement may not be around by the time um, the regulations kick in, 
There are proposed regulations that were issued just last month in July. Um, public comments open until August 23rd. So as to that requirement, it may not be around by the time the regulations come into effect, but for now, you need to do so. I also wanna note that again, um, I noted earlier that the HR data is largely exempt, but for this notice and safeguarding um, the data, um, but you do have certain obligations that may come into effect come the top of the year. So um, the exemption's been extended out quite a bit. Um, at first, it was supposed to be January 1st, 2021. Then it got kicked to this year, January 1st, 2022. But when California voters approved the CPRA, it extended the exemption all the way to January 1st, 2023. So although you say, oh, wow, I have about four months, that's more than enough time to draft the notice and get prepared to include all of the CCPA rights um, now that there's nine of them. But you need to be aware that from January 1st, 2023, there's a 12 month look back period. So you should be able to provide uh, data all the way back to January, 2022. So people are kind of surprised that this is on the list this year, but we are seeing an increase in claims that basically arise out of companies failure to provide proper sexual harassment training. As I'm sure you all remember, it's more than 10 years ago that we started mandatory training of supervisors in California, where they receive at least two hours of training every other year. Um, in the last couple of years, the requirement for the size of the company dropped to five. So employers with five or more employees must provide training. And you also must now provide training um, to hourly employees or non-exempt, non-supervisory employees, one hour of required training every other year. So the claims we're seeing are several fold. One, straight failure to train claims. And, and I don't know how it's getting off the list, but employers are just forgetting to uh, keep accurate records as to when the last training was, then train new people as they're hired or train every two years. We're seeing um, a lot of people not paying attention to comments and jokes that are made during the training that actually are increasing liability. And we're seeing um, claims for negligent supervision as a result of allowing specific people not to go through training. So to back up and kind of give you an idea, um, there was a lawsuit recently and the employer's defense was, we have 95% of our supervisors trained, that's an A, right? Well, no, in California, it's really a strict liability statute. You have an absolute duty to train people and the fact that you know you have untrained supervisors isn't, can't be defended by a substantial compliance test. Um, two, the comments being made during training um, initially, when the training first rolled out, there were a lot of people who wanted to talk about their First Amendment rights to say whatever they wanted. Those mm -hmm. claims pretty much have diminished over time, but we're getting people where you have senior people in management who joke during the training. Hey, I don't have to worry about this. Everybody loves me. Uh, we have insurance for that. You know, any of those kinds of comments. Those are the sorts of things that actually where the training, although you are checking the box of doing the required training, employees will turn around and argue at the company sponsored sexual harassment training, the VP of sales got up and said he didn't need to worry about this because we have EPLI insurance that covers all that. And so I knew that I could not come forward with a sexual harassment complaint because I work under him and it would not be taken seriously. So you can see that you really have to pay attention and monitor what's happening during the training and make sure that none of your managers are coming across with a message that's anything but supportive. A couple of ways you can deal with this. <clears throat> your managers should be trained separately, but you might want to divide it up into the key people in the company who arguably are managing agents and whose actions maybe make the company liable um, at, because they are managing agents, and then lower level supervisors who may not have as much experience into why this is important and proper decorum during such meetings. Um, and you probably don't want to go with the minimum anymore. Uh, we see a lot of lawyers argue in lawsuits, the plaintiff's lawyers, that you pay so little attention to this, you have a perfunctory online training every other year, and there's no message from management saying this is important to us. There's no supplemental emphasis by the company that this is important. So think about doing more than the minimum, whether it's uh, pre-Christmas season saying, hey, company events and client events, please be mindful that your behavior has to be consistent with our policy, which brings us to the last level that we are seeing an increase in claims 
um, the claims that deal with drinking after company events. I think everybody was so tied up with COVID and tired of being at home and by themselves that when the events started happening, um, they happened with a vengeance. So do pay attention to setting forth expectations as to proper behavior and non-behavior at company events and remind people that they're to temper their drinking and they are to be respectful of all people and not violate any of the sexual harassment rules that are set forth. Um, so we have a question, is sexual harassment training required for California companies or companies out of state with remote employees in California? Both. So the way the law is written, um, if you have five or more employees, then the law covers you. And even if only three of them may be in California, the law has been interpreted so far as to cover you in California. And if you read through the law carefully, you are required to train people who are supervising people in California. So for example, if you've got a product manager that has five California employees and 10 Nevada employees, that person should probably be trained on California law. And it's not a bad idea to do the training nationwide. In every state, the fact that you've done training and raised how you can complain about sexual harassment, to whom you should complain, and what the company tolerates and doesn't tolerate can be a defense. In states like California, it's not a complete defense, but there are other states where the fact that you had an effective procedure for preventing sexual harassment that you communicated clearly to employees and you put in their hands exactly what they needed to do if they had complaints will, can be a complete defense. So it's not a bad idea to take California's law and implement it throughout the company. Melanie's gonna talk a little bit about mandatory arbitration agreements now. Right, so this is a big issue, not only all over the country, but especially here in California, because according to an expanded report by the Economic Policy Institute back in 2018, mandatory arbitration is required in nearly 68% of California workplaces. We think it's important to highlight that um, as, your deal, as you're considering documents on the onboarding um, process, because there's been a lot of recent developments here in case law at the Supreme Court level and at the Ninth Circuit level regarding claims brought under the Fair Employment and Housing Act or FEHA, Labor Code, and Private Attorney General's Act or PAGA claims. With these recent developments, the future of mandatory arbitration agreements is in flux right now. Um, so as it relates to FEHA and labor code claims, in 2019, California passed a law prohibiting employers from requiring employees to sign an arbitration agreement as a condition of employment. Um, that was through Assembly Bill 51, um, which created labor code section 432.6. We put in this um, PowerPoint for you, some highlighted language showing how um, arbitration agreements um, in terms of mandatory arbitration agreements were not allowed under this labor code section. But um, the US Chamber of Commerce and other entities, we're just gonna call them the Chamber of Commerce altogether, um, challenged this um, right on the eve before it went into effect. It was supposed to go into effect January 1st of 2020. So in December um, of 2019, Chamber of Commerce filed a motion for a preliminary injunction and a complaint for declaratory and injunctive relief. Um, the TRO was issued December 30th, 2019, literally um, right before the, the statute went into effect. Um, and then later in February of 2020, the preliminary injunction was issued um, in joining the enforcement of Labor Code Section 432.6. Um, the California Attorney General's Office then appealed this issue just shortly thereafter. The Ninth Circuit um, finally issued a decision back in September of 2021, um, reversing the lower court's um, ruling um, that Labor Code Section 432.6 was preempted by the FAA. The Ninth Circuit said, actually it's not. Um, it's not preempted because it's aimed at conduct that occurred before the employer employee entered into the arbitration agreement. And if you recall, I'll go back to the previous slide, noting there in subsection F where it says nothing in the section is intended to invalidate a written arbitration agreement that's otherwise enforceable under the Federal Arbitration Act or the FAA. The court kind of latched onto that um, and said, look, um, because this information's in here, then section two of the FAA doesn't apply. But the Chamber of Commerce filed a petition for a hearing on Bonk in October, 2021. Um, 
and there's been no decision issued on that petition. In fact, the Ninth Circuit held, um, issued an order in February of this year saying, we know that this petition for rehearing on bonk's been filed. Um, we are not going to make a decision one way or the other until the Supreme Court issues um, its decision in Viking Rivers versus Moriana, which I'll touch on shortly. Um, Viking Rivers came out about six to seven weeks ago in June um, of this year, but there's still been no movement from the Ninth Circuit on this issue. So as of now, the injunction against um, Labor Code Section 432.6 is in place. So that brings us to PAGA claims and how they're um, kind of changing right now, now that the Viking River Cruises decision came out on June 15th. So here the Supreme Court um, granted certiorari to decide whether representative claims filed under PAGA may be compelled to individual arbitration. Um, as brief background, the plaintiff filed a PAGA action in California State Court against her former employer, Viking River Cruises. Viking River then filed a motion to compel arbitration um, based on the fact that the employment contract included a mandatory arbitration agreement and a class action waiver, which barred disputes as the class, collective, or representative actions under PAGA. Um, the lower courts in um, California denied the motion to compel arbitration, citing the Estanian rule in California. Some of you may be familiar with that. Um, it's a California Supreme Court decision um, that has a rule against individual arbitration of PAGA claims. So in applying that, they held that the waivers of PAGA standing are contrary to California policy, and that PAGA claims can't be split into um, arbitrable individual claims and non-arbitrable representative claims. So this issue then goes up to the Supreme Court and they reverse the lower courts, courts holding that the FAA does preempt California's Iskanian rule insofar as there's this um, prohibition against um, the division of individual and non-individual claims. So what this means then is that the PAGA representative claims can't be dismissed just because they're representative in nature, but that once the plaintiff's individual claims are sent to arbitration, then they lack standing for the representative claims. So what's this mean here? What's the takeaway here? Well, first in the long run, um, we will not see the plaintiff's bar submit to individual arbitration voluntarily or even easily will likely see continued challenges to mandate arbitration, mandatory arbitration by the plaintiff's bar unless and until California legislators choose to act. Um, and as alluded to before, California legislator or the courts may try to provide standing for representative claims to proceed um, separately from individual claims. Um, that kind of was left open, so we'll see what happens. Um, I reviewed the California Attorney General's office um, and their stance on um, the, the decision from Viking Rivers Cruises. And, you know, there may be a hint of some continued action on that front. But for now, the mandatory arbitration agreements, they're enforceable, but um, at least in certain contexts, but employers should keep in mind that uh, there are still the traditional grounds by which an arbitration agreement can be challenged. And the courts may develop a consistent body of law around some of these more traditional areas. So for example, for the FAA purposes, you still have to establish that um, interstate commerce was implicated here. Um, you still have to deal with whether a contract exists. Um, that's always a defense to enforceability and you'll need to be sure to comply with California case law regarding unconscionability, both substantive and procedural. Procedurally, this can be accomplished by demonstrating that the employee knew what they were signing. Um, this means that the agreement wasn't buried in a handbook. Um, it allows employee as much time as possible to review the agreement by, you know, clicking through, um, flipping to other documents and onboarding, onboarding documents, for example, um, even inserting ever so often throughout the agreement, you know, an initial line or signature line for them as well, um, allowing them to save the document and then come back at a later time to finish. These are all ways that you can um, establish procedural unconscionability. Another, or that it's not procedurally unconscionable, I should say. Um, another thing to keep in mind here would be waiver. Um, as always, plaintiffs will argue that an employer waived their rights to compel arbitration. So keep that in mind. Um, so 
our best guess is that the legislators may focus on the unconscionability piece in light of the right Viking River decision and even its impact on the pending Ninth Circuit's decision and the Bonta matter as well. So for now, you're good to go, but just be careful out there. So before we switch to equal pay, there are a couple of questions on sexual harassment I thought we should take care of. One sure. is, <clears throat> does all training have to be live or can it be recorded training? Um, yes, it can. The requirement is that it be interactive. So there has to be some way for employees to ask questions, but that could be done via chat, via follow-up email. Um, the Department of Fair Employment and Housing also has posted a compliant training for both supervisors and for the uh, regular employees, the one hour training on its website, you can use that as well. Um, the point is to just make sure that it's clear to your employees that the company is committed to this. Another question we got is, what if your management is opposed to having a sexual harassment policy, even if you're doing the training? The, the problem is, is that your duty is to take all steps reasonably necessary to make sure harassment doesn't occur in the workplace. And I think it's so prevalent right now that employers have pretty comprehensive complaint and investigation procedures that it's gonna be hard for you to prove that you've taken all steps needed to eliminate sexual harassment in the workplace if you don't have a policy as to what an employee is supposed to do if they believe they've been subjected to it. So while the statute doesn't say each employer must have a written sexual harassment policy, I think that's implicit in the requirement that you take all steps reasonably necessary to eliminate discrimination and harassment in the workplace. The um, pay equity laws, we, we could take five hours on, but we wanted to point it out because this is something that many people were really surprised by this year. So in California, employers with 100 employees must annually report pay data by sex, race, race and ethnicity, and it's broken down by pay grade. So you can easily go in there and look and see that there are seven men who make this and eight women who make that, and you can do a pretty good comparison as to whether or not there is inequality in the, in the uh, disbursement of who makes how much money. And so pending, they're proposing to drop that requirement down to 15 or more employees. And California and many other states are now asking people in the job posting to disclose the salary ranges. Uh, that's mandatory in Colorado already. California's bill looks like it's going to pass. Uh, New York's bill, the city has already passed it. The point is that um, the doctrine behind all these laws is that you can't have pay inequity that's based solely on historically what someone has made in the past because women tend to start out at a lower level of pay and it perpetuates the inequality that goes forward if you're basing it based on what I earned at my last job rather than what the requirements of this job are. So it's a good time to take a look at your salary ranges and see about equalizing them because you're gonna be all re be reporting them soon. And they will, it'll become very obvious that you've got, for example, managers who make this band and then managers who make this band. And if you don't have a really great reason that one job requires a higher skill set than another one, it could this kind of information can be used against you. Now we want to switch to the big mistakes that people make in hiring. And to give you a preview, it's failure to have good documentation, uh, firing after a leave of absence or a complaint, failure to examine similar circumstances, failure to protect whistleblowers, and not considering providing a severance or release. So on the documentation issue, the issues that we see over and over again are um, that employers, especially in at-will states like California, they believe they're at-will so that they don't need to give a reason for the termination. And that's kind of true, but the problem is, is that you can fire for any reason, but not an illegal reason. And so if someone claims that you've done something discriminatory or retaliatory, you've got to articulate a legitimate business reason. And in this economic market, you're going to want to be known as a somewhat fair employer anyway, someone who puts people on notice if they're having performance issues, or you're going to have a huge problem in recruiting or retention. Um, so before, when you're sitting down to contemplate a final warning or a firing, what is your legitimate business reason that this has to be done and has to be done now? And what are the documents that are in the file? And are they consistent with what you're trying to do? Or should you stop for a second and make sure that you give one more warning that actually clearly puts the employee on notice? The second area that we're seeing, which is deadly, is inconsistencies in reports to EDD. Because the first round of EDD um, hearings is not 
a legitimate court decision. And so it's not race judicata, it's not binding in that first round. People often give a report as to what the reason for termination is that is different from what they actually are gonna to wanna to prove if the employee sues. Um, and many people are hiring outside agencies to do their employment development hearings for them and they don't get them all the documentation they need. So we'll give you a slide in a minute that kind of reminds you as to what you're gonna to have to prove. But um, be sure that when you fill out the form with EDD that someone takes a look at it to make sure it matches what's in the file. Because even though the decision has no impact, that is a, an admission. That is the company's admission as to what they are saying is the reason for the termination. Tell you to do an exit interview. Important for two reasons. One, it gives the employee an opportunity to make a sexual harassment or any other complaint. And two, it gives the employee a chance to get it off their chest. And many of you heard us say before that when we, we depose plaintiffs who sued an employer and we ask them why they sued. The number one reason, and it's more than 50% of the time is they weren't respected in the process. Nobody heard them out. And we're not exaggerating when we say that the simple act of respecting someone and letting them say, Melanie, you're a terrible supervisor. You don't know what you're doing. I have more experience than you do. Um, I, you know, I don't want to work for you anyway. Letting them get it off their chest often stops them from walking into a lawyer's door. So exit interviews are important for that reason as well. Um, you do have to give another notice and change in relationship, the form we talked about in the beginning, the 1089 form, for all employees that are going out the door. And then remember, you're going to see the number one step now in a lawsuit is you get a letter from a lawyer saying, we want the personnel file and the payroll records. And you're required by law to give them or you're fined if you don't. So take a look at those documents before you finalize your firing decision, because what's not in the file as of when you terminate won't be able to be put in the file later. And we just put, to remind you really quickly, um, unemployment be benefits, a lousy employee can still get unemployment. You have to show they voluntarily quit without good cause and good cause would be my spouse is moving, there's no good school in the area, any legitimate reason that they had to quit and move, discharge for willful misconduct. And believe it or not, there are unemployment cases saying that, you know, pilfering 10 coffee mugs with the company logo on it probably isn't willful misconduct. It has to be repeated stealing after warning or refusal of suitable work. So that job went away, but you offered them something they're qualified for at a similar rate of pay, that will, they'll be ineligible for unemployment. And as we noted before, while the actual first decision for unemployment is not something that's admissible against you, if you appeal, then the appellate determination can be used by an employee if you lose. So if it's found that they were not terminated for misconduct and that's all you said they were terminated for, that can be used against you. Emily? So I'll talk about the second um, firing mistake that we see at the termination phase. This is a landmine here and it's not, um, it's firing someone after they've taken a leave or after they raised a wage and hour complaint. Um, when you are considering terminating the, the employment relationship, you need to think about the temporal proximity towards um, in regards to the leave that was taken or the complaint that was raised. Temporal proximity, meaning how much time has passed, right? So um, this is just a hypothetical, but it's probably not a good idea to have an employee come back from some kind of protected leave um, and then say, I'm going to fire you two days later. Let's really think through that. Likewise, if an employee says, wow, I'm looking at my pay statement and I think I'm missing some overtime um, and you decide to fire them the next day, even though it's completely unrelated to the overtime issue that they pointed out, or it's completely unrelated to the fact that they were on leave, the, the, the closeness and time by which the firing took place to the complaint or the leave raises some issues. So be thoughtful about the timing here. We also encourage you to think about the interactive process, um, when it, especially when it comes to employees who take leave. So sometimes you run across a situation where an employee has been off work for months and months and months, or you know, they work for a little bit of time and then they're off for a long time. And they work for a little bit of time and they're off for a long time. It can become very frustrating from an employer standpoint because you just want the work done. And this often leads to a desire to obviously terminate this employee, um, especially if you feel that, wow, this person is exhausted, they're CIFRA or FMLA leave, or this person's not even entitled to CIFRA leave yet because they haven't worked here long enough. 
However, whether the employee has any kind of entitlement to the FMLA or SIF relief, that is a separate consideration um, from the impact of accommodations, meaning you need to think about any accommodations that still need to be provided to this person under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so for this reason, you need to engage in the interactive process with the employee to determine if there's an, an accommodation in place that would allow them to return to their position and perform the functions thereof. Um, this process will also help address um, any disabilities that the employee may have, but you need to make sure that you're not asking for any kind of medical diagnosis within this interactive process as well. So make sure you complete it before you make that decision to end the employment relationship. Um, finally here, you wanna think about fixing any wage issues that may have occurred. So let's go back to an example of this person who says, wow, I think I'm missing some overtime. It's August, 2022. They're looking back, they're especially proactive about tax season. So they're thinking, oh my goodness, I just wanna be prepared. And they say, wow, back in January, I worked you know, crazy amount of hours that day, but I didn't get any overtime for it. Um, if you are at this point where it's August and you wanna let this employee go, review their pay records. And if you're seeing an issue where where they weren't provided over time, um, go ahead and provide it. And we encourage employers to tack on interest with it. Ordinarily, the employee is entitled to 10% interest. So at 10% interest here is a good rule of thumb to, to tack that on. While you're at it, you might wanna think about whether there were meal, any meal and rest period violations. Um, meal periods are pretty easy to track because people are clocking out for that. But if you have someone who's consistently taking their lunch break later, past the fifth hour work, or they're clocking in earlier, um, say like at the 27 or 28 mark instead of taking the full 30 um, minute lunch, um, separate and apart from them violating your, your policy on the meal periods, you probably should think about providing the penalties right then and there, as opposed to waiting for them to raise an issue later on with an attorney. So go ahead and provide the penalty, which is an hour rate of pay is the, the amount there. Same thing with rest period as well. These are a little bit more difficult um, to, to, to track, right? Because they don't have to clock out for the rest periods. However, if you can document that they did receive the rest period, either by everyone taking it at the same time within a department or some other like written schedule, something that establishes this, um, then that's helpful. But in terms of ending the relationship, if you notice that this person has had issues with taking their, all their arrest periods, make sure that you account for that by providing the penalty ahead of time. If you don't, you're gonna run into issues where you have late wage payments, which is $100 for each initial violation. If you have subsequent or willful violations, it's $200 for each failure to pay them. And then you have waiting time penalties, which could be up to 30 days pay. So it's something to take care of now as opposed to later on. So our next point is really a, one we just wanna make quickly, which is failure to examine similar situations and statistics. You should have a process where you take a look at whether or not you've had other similar violations in the past and they've been treated the same. And you probably wanna consider making this privileged, especially if you have in-house counsel that can review that for you so that you can take care of discrimination claims by saying, you know, this is a female, have we had this happen before? And was it the same race, color, national origin, ancestry, sex? You have to decide to make these discussions privileged up front. You can't just CC counsel and assume that it becomes privileged. So have a determination for when you're looking at whether or not you're treating similarly situated employees of protected categories in the same manner, that you have a privileged method for reviewing that. We might go a little over here, but we will um, try and end right on time and then take questions. Those of you who can stay past 10, um, please do but we wanna re be respectful of everyone's time. So Melanie's gonna explain quickly now about failure to protect whistleblowers. That's right, so earlier when I talked about providing the whistleblower postings in the, uh, the workplace, this is where this comes into play, right? Failing to account for them at the termination process could raise some issues. So when an employee is trying to um, assert that they were a whistleblower and they were wrongfully terminated because of that, um, they have to establish a prima facie case, but the employer can overcome that, overcome that by showing that they had a legitimate business reason for terminating, terminating the relationship, and that's done by clear and convincing evidence. 
Um, here, we really want to encourage employers to broaden their understanding of what protected activity may be encompassed here. And we pointed out um, Labor Code Section 1102 for your consideration, um, which prohibits employers from threatening or terminating employees in an attempt to influence their political beliefs or their political actions. So if you have an employee who's attending a political rally that you may find distasteful, um, you may want to fire them for that. Let's slow down and think about that. Same thing if a person's wearing some symbolic clothing or jewelry. Of course, you still have to think about your company dress code policy, right? You have uniforms in place that don't allow for buttons and the like, that's still at play here. But if this person's you know, sporting what you would feel is a politically offensive t-shirt um, you know, off duty, let's think about that. Um, if they're participating in certain litigation activity, that could be also protected activity. Um, and one thing we wanted to note as well is think about people's personal posts online. We live in a very partisan era right now, as I'm sure all of you know, um, and you'll have issues where someone's posting online um, something that is pretty offensive, right? So let's say, for example, this person says, I support X political candidate who said that X group of people should go back to X continent or X country. That can get a little dicey because you may think, wow, that is very offensive and that's not what we stand for. And you typically see a lot of this occurring on platforms like LinkedIn, especially where you know someone says something offensive under like my profile or something. I take that and screenshot that and send it to that person's employer. And the employer says, that person no longer works for us. We fire them. Before you know, shooting from the hip here, think about whether that activity would have been protected um, under Section 1102 and Section 1101 as well, it was tied to their views about the political candidate whom they support. So just be cautious here. So the final thing we wanted to talk to you about was not considering a severance or release. Um, first of all, we note a couple things can't be released. If you find out that you owe somebody wages, the wages ought to be paid before you offer them a general release of all claims because you have to be able to prove, unless there's some real good faith dispute over whether the wages were owed, that the wages have been paid in full 100%. You can't use that as consideration. Um, in California, you can't not include non-compete agreements or the whole release can fail. So you can't say the employee can't go work for the following competitors. California also has a law, as do many states now, that you can't have an overbroad non-disparagement agreement that arguably would not allow me to disclose if I had claims of sexual harassment or discrimination. And then the one area we see that is often overlooked is if you have multiple terminations and you're requiring age releases, you can't get an age release without getting 45 days notice if it's multiple terminations instead of 21. And you have to have the little disclosure that says, um, the, these are the people who are considered for the job elimination, and here are the people who weren't. So for example, if you were getting rid of 20% of your sales force, and you were doing it based on uh, quantity of sales in the last quarter, your disclosure would say, by category of person, you don't have to give the names, but category of person and age, who was considered for it, and who was included in the RIF class. And that's we see a lot of age releases right now that were multiple terminations that do not have the required uh, language in it. So at the very end of the slide, we just put in because people are forgetting to pay attention here. Uh, personnel files and payroll records are often requested by plaintiff's lawyers. You have to give current and former employees those documents. You want to have read them before the termination so that there's no surprises to you when you provide them to the plaintiff's lawyer. And um, there, there are penalties. So if you don't do it on time, it's an automatic $750 penalty. But more importantly, they can also recover attorney's fees if they have to sue you to recover the penalty. So pay attention to those deadlines and get those documents out the door um, as soon as you see the request. Right, and those deadlines would mean 30 days for the personnel files and records, and then 21 days for the payroll records. So sometimes people get caught up on the distinction there, but you need to be aware of that. So we have one question, um, what do we do if there, the employer has a secret personnel file that we just see after the termination? Um, you have to quickly decide whether it's really part of the personnel file. If it was used to justify a hiring or firing decision or a decision based on pay or promotion, then those documents will need to be included and you'll wanna make sure you include them before you send out the first file. Um, 
Can you remind us of the details for the requirement to issue final paycheck at time of termination? So if you fire them, they get their paycheck on their last day of employment. If you're out of state and you can't get them their paycheck, then you could say, for example, um, Melanie, we're going to terminate you effective Friday, but you're relieved from your duty today. Would you like to come in and get your paycheck on Friday, or would you like us to Federal Express it to your house to arrive there on Friday? And that would be completely compliant. There was a lot of debate for a while as to whether or not you could actually mail checks to the person's house because the labor code provided for uh, the paycheck being delivered to the last place where the employee worked. But right now, um, as long as you've got a consent form on file, you can go ahead and direct deposit or Federal Express to their house. I would get consent and make sure that when the deposit hits the bank, they're still in the payroll. So that's why many of you now are terminating people early, releasing them from the duty to come to work, but telling them on Friday, you either can pick it up, have a direct deposit or uh, get your check mailed to your house and you're gonna be paid through Friday. So we'll, we'll stick around for a few more questions, but we wanna make sure that everybody who needs to leave can. Thank you so much for attending today's presentation. And please, when you fill out your reviews, do suggest topics. This one, as I said, came out from suggestion of many attendees and we're happy to present on whatever you all need. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending. Oh, the name of the agency that has the harassment prevention training, it's the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, DFEH. And I think if you go in and just start typing um, State of California, Department of Fair Employment and Housing, it will pull it up for you. But if not, just email and we'll give it to you. Another question, can we just use that training every year? Um, Technically, yes, it would meet the minimum requirements, but I think it's more effective if you can add in a few either direct statements by HR or the president saying, you know, we gave you sexual harassment training. Here's where our policy is located. We really feel that respect of everybody in the workplace is important. So if you have any questions about our policy, please go see HR. When you add in personal messages like that from people who are high up in the company, it makes all the difference in whether or not people pay attention. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you all very much. And if we didn't get to your question, we'll try and uh, catch you in an email. Thank you. Or feel free to call. Thank you very much.